Welcome to the Nord Pentecostal Church live stream, a place to be family. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning and, and joining us for the service. We're just going to pause for a moment before Pastor Larry speaks and just for a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this week, Lord, and thank you, especially for all the warm weather we've been having. Just pray for today, Lord, that you'll bless us all and that you'll oh, bring a soon end to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic that's going on, Lord. We just pray that that'll end soon and that we'll be able to get together and enjoy services together and be with our friends. And for those that are off work, Lord, that they can get back to work and just... Bless us today, Lord. Keep us all safe and uh, bring us back together again soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Edna and John, for that wonderful opening. It's great to see your faces again. I uh, just wanted to let everybody know, um, before we start this morning, as we go into worship, uh, that it is Pentecost Sunday on our church calendar. And what that represents is uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church as recorded in Acts uh, 1 and 2, actually the promise of Jesus throughout the Gospels that the Spirit would come upon the people. It came on the disciples in Acts 2, and we'll discuss that a little bit this morning in the sermon as we talk about praying with power, uh, but it is by association as followers of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is available to us, and all that he brings with him yep. is available to us as well. Mm -hmm. So join us as we worship this morning. If you are looking for information about the church, uh, if you're watching this maybe as a, a newcomer or somebody who's just visiting our channel, uh, I invite you to send an email to our church office, npc at nexacom.net, and you can get added to our newsletter so that you have an idea of all of our events, of everything that is coming forward as we continue to work through this uh, COVID-19 season, this isolation. But it is, uh, we are still active, our ministries are still moving forward, they're just virtual, and we continue to do things uh, to engage one another and to be an encouragement to one another. So if you're not on that list, we can add you. Uh, and if you know somebody who doesn't have internet and you're getting that email, please let them know the information as it comes. Just wanted to get that out to you now so that you know uh, there is stuff happening and please do engage as it comes. Why don't you join us this morning, uh, wherever you are at home, if you're going to stand, if you're going to sit, however it is that you're going to worship as we enter it. Let's just welcome the Holy Spirit into our homes and uh, he is here. Is here.
God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Presence,
sing that again. I love you. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I
just thank you that you are so so good that you left us our helper and that we are not alone I thank you father that you are with us and we are so in love with you amen thank you for leading us again this morning Heidi and Michaela Uh, it is great as always, to be able to gather with our uh, families, with one another, by ourselves, and know that God is in our house, wherever we are, that God is there. I'm going to take a moment and just pray for the sermon, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into where God is leading us today. Father, thank you that you are in this place today, and that you are in every home as well. God, I pray that as we go through this teaching, Lord, that you would open our eyes, that you would speak first to me as the one who is sharing this and allow me to know and understand what it is that you're speaking to us. God, that you would speak the truth from my mouth, that others would hear it, and that it would change the way that we live our lives. And so, Lord, we give you thanks that you are in our place and you are ministering to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, As a uh, teenager, growing up, just getting into the church when I was about 17 years old, 16, 17, uh, I didn't have a lot of um, exposure to anything in the church. And one of the first things that I was exposed to at youth group was a video of something called the power team. And we didn't bring them into our church. And some of you might know right now in your home who the power team was. For those of you who don't, it was a group of people who would come in by invitation to your church and they would share the gospel. They'd share the gospel. But first what they would do is they would put on these incredible feats of strength. They would do things like ripping uh, phone books. They would roll up frying pans. They would bend rebar. They would do crazy things of strength and then share about the gospel and the power of God in your life. And I always remember watching that the first time and going, um, I'm never going to be like those people. I didn't have any interest to be this amazingly sculpted muscular person and I didn't want to roll up frying pans or rip phone books even though I figured out the trick to ripping phone books and you don't have to be that strong to do it I just knew that's not something that I wanted to do and and strength in that area was not uh, my calling I guess you would say question have you ever had someone well-meaning tell you that something just wasn't for you that you didn't have access to it that you're not just You're just not cutting it in a certain area. See, I knew I wouldn't cut it as somebody in the power team, but I also had somebody come to me who was probably well-meaning, who would look at me and say, you know, in your prayer life, you're not praying in power. Now, there was a belief in some at the time, and, and that's where I think this person was coming from, that powerful prayers were meant reserved for a select few that the normal Christian couldn't pray in power, that you had to be what they called an intercessor, though that word isn't really an appropriate use for this meaning. Um, Maybe they referred to them as prayer warriors at the time as well. That might be a little more appropriate, but it still isn't fully applicable to the situation that we're talking about. So for years, I believe that my prayer life was subpar because I wasn't an intercessor or a prayer warrior. Then I discovered a truth through study and listening to good teaching. So this morning, I want to talk to you about praying in power. We're going to be reading a number of passages, considering a number of passages, but we're going to spend time this morning in Romans 8, where we will focus much of our attention today within. We're going to read a larger portion of the text to give context to a topic at hand. And I want to mention to you beforehand that your applicable truth today, what I want you to take home, your, your, so what's the big deal for this message, is any who truly follow Jesus are actively praying with power. So we're going to break down now how this is possible. We're going to read in the NIV from Romans 8, verses 1 to 17. Therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, uh, 
to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit, who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Now as you read through this passage, you might ask yourself first, what does this really have to do with praying in power? Well, I'm introducing you to this topic by walking you through Uh, a way of engaging your mind to understand that your prayers are full of power, to establish truth within, uh, within your heart right now that as a believer, you pray in power. But as you read through the passage, what becomes abundantly clear within it, at least to me, is the freedom that we have been given through Christ. That once we were settled in sin and death, now through the Spirit of Christ, We are alive and free from the chains which would hold us back from a real relationship with Jesus. Paul sets out in this passage to express the difference between one who believes uh, and follows Jesus and one who does not. It's in verses 9 9 through 11 that I want to place our focus today. These verses begin to outline for us what life in the Spirit looks like and why I have said that those who follow Jesus when they pray do indeed Pray in power. So listen to these verses again. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. The argument that Paul is making to the church in Rome is that in Christ, they are no longer subject to the slavery of sin and what it would hold them to. Yes, they will in fact still die a physical death because sin has made that necessary. They will, however, never face eternal death and eternal separation from God. He goes on to express to them that because of their faith in Jesus, They now have within them the very same spirit who raised Jesus from the tomb and brought him to stand before hundreds of witnesses. That very power which brought life back into the physical body of Jesus is alive in the believers of Rome. Not only is he alive, but in verse 10 we read that they have been given life because of righteousness. So what is righteousness? It's a a big word we hear a lot around the church, but what does it really mean? Quickly, but it does align to the message. Righteousness is defined uh, in, the, in the dictionary as behavior that is morally, morally justifiably right, meaning that you would meet the standards of society according to specific qualities of an individual, like justice, morality, uprightness. 
The Bible, however, explains that this standard is actually only measured according to the perfection of God. Meaning, unless you are spotlessly perfect, unless you've done absolutely everything right, never sinned once in your life, you're not perfect. You have to be spotless to be righteous. So how does Paul say that we have life because of righteousness? That comes through the death of Jesus, which was given on our behalf in order that we would be seen by God as perfect. So now we see that Paul has established that through the death of Jesus, we are made perfect in God's sight. When we confess and follow him, and in this we have the spirit, uh, when we confess and follow him, we have Jesus in us, and in this we have the spirit who raised him from the dead living in us. Now I want to make clear that this is not a spooky science fiction type uh, spiritual encounter. Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead who leads believers towards truth among other actions. And in this passage, he gives us life. By account of his presence in our lives, it would seem natural that he gives us power as well. And the Bible does, in fact, give clear definition to this in Acts 1 verse 8. Jesus, as he's preparing to leave earth and go back to his throne, speaks one last time to the disciples and says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses to Jer in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It should be mentioned that this filling of the spirit Jesus is speaking of, which happened after a number of days of prayer uh, for those waiting in the upper room, was specifically a supernatural power to share the gospel to all the world. However, it is never argued that the Holy Spirit can be separated from this power. Meaning, if one repents and believes in Christ, as the Bible tells us to, they receive the Spirit who comes with his power to each new Christian. The differentiation of the two fillings when somebody is first saved and this moment at Pentecost uh, is seen in Acts 2 when the believers begin to speak in languages they did not previously know. And in doing so, they were actually presenting the gospel to foreigners who were gathered around them. So we have come to know this in church circles as baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to discuss that briefly in a few short minutes. The point of sharing this is to show you that the Spirit comes to us and brings along with him power for the believer. Paul emphasizes this in two different letters. First, to the Romans in 1513, as he prays for the believers, saying, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This verse is specifically valuable to us in this season of life. We are in need, all of us, of joy, peace, and hope. And Paul tells us that it is actually available to us, completely accessible, through the Holy Spirit. He then says to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. In other words, Paul understood that his only hope to present truth to those in Corinth, and really by effect to uh, any who ever listened to anyone preach, is the Spirit's power. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead and who is now alive in us, the same power within Paul and which was active in Jesus is now active in us. The incredible nature of the Holy Spirit is that he does not simply stand around when we go into prayer and watch us use words and then add power to them. He empowers us to pray. Again, Paul in his wisdom takes, uh, makes it clear to us that the Spirit is active in our prayer lives, telling the church in Rome, uh, in Romans 8 still, but verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He is not passive. He is not silent. And when we fail to know what, what to pray, Paul tells us the Spirit intercedes through us in wordless groans. Now, most likely, these are not audible groans, but the Spirit actively speaking in the supernatural on our behalf. As he is within us and around us, he always knows and understands what is occurring in our lives and is ready to speak for us when we are unable to speak. Here's how it can be explained. 
if you have an active prayer life, or even if you have one that's not active, but you've encountered a moment where you went to pray and didn't say a single word, but just sat or laid or stood or paced the entire time. And once that prayer time was done, once you concluded with just wondering what, what has just happened and said, amen, and you walked away thinking that was one of the most effective times of prayer I've ever had, even though I didn't say anything, that was the moment that the Holy Spirit was interceding for you. See, wordless groans may in fact be the sound of our breath or our sobs or even our laughter as Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. This week, I had a personal moment of acknowledging this, the loss of our family pet and sobbing and realizing Holy Spirit is interceding in this moment. So we have established now that we are made righteous through Christ. And in that, the Spirit of Christ is now alive and active in us. We have established that the Spirit is powerful and he brings all of that power into the life of the believer who then have access to that power at any time. Finally, we have established that the Spirit will at times, probably more often than we know, intercede on our behalf. At the outset, I mentioned that it is my belief that all who follow Jesus are people who pray in power. You may have been told differently, but the truth is, the real fact behind all of this is that as a Christian, your prayers are full of power. The three areas we have established point to this, but there is one more verse in scripture which proves this. In James chapter 5, verse 16, the second part of the verse, we read the following. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. James then goes on to cite Elijah, not as a prophet or a spokesperson uh, chosen by God, but as a human being, even as we are, one who prayed and was heard by God. When you are a follower of Jesus, you are made righteous, perfect, through his sacrifice on the cross. The Spirit then comes and gives life, bringing with him power, making each one of us a person who prays in power. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The best news of all of this, the Spirit is accessible to any of us. What it takes from us is a step toward faith. Before I conclude this morning, it is Pentecost Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, so I wanted to take a brief moment and talk about what Pentecost is, what the aforementioned baptism of the Spirit is, and let you know how that applies to our message of praying with power. So first off, what is Pentecost? Well, Pentecost is the celebration of the moment the Spirit came upon the believers who were gathered in the upper room waiting for the promise that Jesus spoke of in Acts 1 verse 8. The promise then plays out in Acts 2, specifically verses 1 through 12. And in this instance, the Spirit comes in the form of tongues of fire, which give the believers the ability to speak in unknown tongues, a practice that is mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament, especially by Paul in his earlier letters. Now in the church today, this event is taught as the moment a believer receives a prayer language. So you may have heard the words uh, sp speaking in tongues or praying in tongues. The nature of these languages is somewhat mysterious as there have been instances of people speaking in ancient dialects with perfect accents and enunciation. Some who speak in unknown languages still to this day and others who use current day languages which they are unaware of using. I actually have a friend who went on a missions trip to a church in a, in a foreign country, different language, and they went into a prayer meeting. And in that prayer meeting, off in the corner in a dark area, he walked over because he had heard a man speaking perfect English. And so as he walked over, he realized that everyone else is, is praying in their uh, foreign language, in their native language, and he's speaking English. So out of curiosity, he walked over to encounter him and speak with him of how excited he was to hear another man speaking English. And the man stared at him, not understanding what he was saying, but recognizing that's the language I pray in. And so through an interpreter, it came up to the knowledge that that was the man speaking in tongues, praying in this, this language that God had gifted him with, but he didn't understand a word. But my friend did, because perfect English was being spoken as a language given to someone who was baptized in the Spirit, just as those in Acts chapter 2 were. Now, I mention all of this because it is the practice of the Pentecostal church to teach on tongues and their relevance and importance in the church today, but also 
to give you some clear guidance about prayer in power. As I said uh, earlier, and I stand by the statement, all believers have access to the Spirit when they follow Jesus. He comes into them at the first moment with his absolute power, so your prayers are always powerful and effective. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is seen as a second filling, which is effective to spread the gospel around the world and often brings with it a new language of prayer. See, I'm not convinced that this one gives you more power in your prayer life. But certainly, I do know people who are powerful prayer warriors who do not speak in tongues, but know and understand the spirit alive in them. The prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. So is the second baptism necessary? No, to live as a Christian, to, to have faith, to walk in prayer, it is not necessary. However, Paul does say that he wishes all people would receive it and practice it. But to have faith, you do not need it. So why is it important and why is it emphasized in some, uh, why is it emphasized in certain denominations and fellowships? Well, I see it this way. Pursuing the gifts of the Spirit, any or all of them, encourages other believers and it pushes the individual into a closer walk with God. More trust is then built and faith grows in that atmosphere. I also see that all the other gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the Bible are the Holy Spirit working through you as a person, through your flesh. For example, healing comes through the laying on of hands and prayer. Prophecy through the mind and the mouth. Tongues is the flesh working through the activity of the Spirit. It stands apart as the one gift consistently available to any who seek it, no matter the moment or the location. It is a complete and active partnership between you and Holy Spirit. In this, I believe we access new levels of understanding of how the Spirit works, not in any way to gain more power in our prayer life, but certainly to understand how powerful the Spirit is in us. And it helps us to recognize when He is active and leading us so that we can respond. Are your prayers powerful without the baptism? Absolutely they are. I will not argue with you that they are, they are powerful and effective. I only bring this to you because the Bible says that any who desire this special gift need only ask for it, and the Spirit gives as He determines. I bring it to you because it is the truth and is an active uh, participation of the Spirit in our lives. It's how He actively moves through us. It is something that I engage in, and it's a wonderful gift that He gives. And if it is something that you wish to access, you actually only need to pray in your house, in your car, wherever you are. Holy Spirit, open this gift to me. Baptize me as you did to those in Acts 2. And then you speak the words that he gives to you. So in conclusion this morning, if you desire uh, the gift of tongues, you just need to open your mouth and pray for it. and Say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you to baptize me. I also encourage each one of you, when you pray, know that your words are full of power. As the Spirit is alive in you, interceding on your behalf, and is within you the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are alive and well and that you have given us the promise of your Holy Spirit. That you offer us the Spirit at the moment that we come to you in repentance. And you make our prayers powerful and effective. But Lord, you also offer a second infilling of the Spirit in what we call the baptism of the Spirit, when new power, a new sense of, of really of urgency comes to us that we can share around this world the gospel in power. And Father, I pray for each person listening right now, for those who, who, who may have believed at some point that their prayers are not powerful and effective. God, I pray you erase that, that lie from their head. God, you have spoken in your word through James that the prayer of a righteous person, which is anybody who follows Jesus, who truly follows you, has the spirit alive in them, their prayers are powerful. So Father, speak that to them. Allow them to know and to carry forth at this moment that they are working through your active and powerful Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for any who would seek to have the, the gift of tongues, of, of, of speaking in tongues in this new language in, in prayer, the baptism in Acts 2 that we read, 
as they pray, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to them and speak to them through their spirit and engage that. And so, Father, as we conclude in worship today, I invite you to remain in our houses, encounter us, change our lives, fill us more and more with your spirit and with your power. Help us to come more alive. Send revival to our land, Lord, and start with me. Father, we worship you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us as we continue to worship this morning. And a reminder, if you would like to be added to the church email list, just send an email to npc at nexacom.net, and we will add you to that list so you can keep on track with all of the events coming. Remember to check our Facebook for youth and children's and for our prayer on Wednesday nights and uh, new ways that will come out of how we can engage one another and encounter each other in relationship and in life. Have a wonderful day.
And Father, we just thank you. We just thank you. Lord, you can have it all. And we surrender our lives to you. And we welcome you into this place. We welcome you into our homes. We welcome you into our town and our community. Father, have it all, Lord. Have all of our love. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.